So uh, this talk is uh, going to be a little bit anomalous at a string theory conference. It would perhaps be more natural at a summer school. But anyway, the goal will be to explain two things. One is the riesz leader theorem, which is the basic result showing that entanglement is unavoidable in quantum field theory. And the second will be a very specific version of monotonicity of relative entropy, which has been invoked by many speakers at this meeting, including this morning. Relative entropy is monotonic under decreasing the size of a region. So for example, the second statement was used by Aaron Wall in proving a generalized second law of thermodynamics. If one's familiar with the proof of the second statement, then it's not too difficult to understand the general proof of strong subadditivity of quantum entropy. Well, unfortunately, we won't have time for this. We would have had time if we skipped the first part. But it wasn't logical to skip the first part, because the first part really explains why the second part makes sense in the context of quantum field theory. So if you want to read the second part and a lot of other stuff, you could look in my article. And I'd like to say that the reason I wrote that article is that I was unhappy not understanding the proof of strong subadditivity. So intuitive explanations claiming intuitively that strong that uh, mon relative entropy is monotonic and changing the size of the region because it expresses the distinguishability of states and so on are not convincing because without knowing strong subadditivity you cannot show that the formal definition of relative entropy has the kind of interpretation that's invoked in the alleged intuitive arguments. So we'll begin with the riesz leader theorem, which must have seemed like a paradox when it was first discovered. So we consider a quantum field theory in Minkowski space-time M with a Hilbert space H that contains a vacuum state omega. There's an algebra of local operators whose action can produce all states from the vacuum. Well, actually, all states in a superselection sector. So we will just work in that sector. For simplicity in the notation, we assume that the operator algebra is generated by a Hermitian scalar field phi. So states obtained by acting on the vacuum with any number of copies of phi at different points are dense in the Hilbert space, more exactly in the vacuum sector. The riesz leader theorem says that actually we get a dense set of states in the vacuum sector if we restrict the points x1 up to xn to any possibly very small open set in Minkowski space. So here, this is meant to be an open set in space-time. And if we restrict the x's to be in that open set, we can still create all the states from the vacuum. Well, if this is false, then there's a state chi which is orthogonal to anything that we can create this way. So this matrix element would then vanish if the x's are all in the open set u. So we'll show that any such chi actually has the property that this correlator vanishes for any x's in Minkowski space without the restriction that the x's should be in the set u. Since states created by the phi's are dense, this implies that chi is zero. So we'll just give a name to this correlation function or matrix element that we're studying, f of x1 up to xn. We're given it vanishes if the x's are all in some small open set. We want to prove it vanishes for all x's without that restriction. As a first step, we pick a future pointing time like vector t, for example, a unit vector in the time direction, and we shift xn by a real multiple of t. So u is a real number. And we define this correlation function where we've shifted xn in the t direction by an amount u. Well, g of u is 0 if u is sufficiently small, because then xn plus ut is still in the open set capital U, this should be. Moreover, if h is the Hamiltonian for translation in the time direction, we could write g of u this way. But since h annihilates the vacuum, we could write it like this with just one insertion of e to the i h u. And since the Hamiltonian is non-negative, this is actually holomorphic in the upper half u plane. So we have a function that's holomorphic in the upper half u plane and vanishes on an interval in the real axis. If we actually knew that the function was holomorphic on that part of the real axis, then since a holomorphic function that vanishes on a section of the real axis is 0, we'd learn that g of u is identically 0. Actually, to begin with, we only know that g of u is holomorphic at the upper half plane. But we can do better using the Cauchy integral formula. 
So in the upper half plane, we could write G of U in terms of a Cauchy integral on this contour. But I could move part of the contour down to the real axis, and then I can drop the part in the region where G of U is known to vanish from the real axis. So then I get a Cauchy integral formula where I only integrate over this little contour. And now I can move G this point downward without finding a singularity. So in particular, I learned that G of U is holomorphic on this bit of the real axis, and therefore it vanishes. So now we know that as long as the first n minus 1 points are in U, and we shift the nth point in the way I said, then this vanishes. Now we just do the same thing again. By the way, I should say that uh, the previous speaker gave me some advice about how to explain this proof without invoking the general edge of the wedge theorem. So that's what we're doing now. So um, we do this again, picking another time-like vector t prime and replacing xn prime by its shift in the t prime direction, again with u prime real. Well, now we make exactly the same argument as before, and we learn that this vanishes for any such xn double prime. But you can get anywhere in Minkowski space-time by starting in a little open set u and zigzagging backwards and forwards in different time-like directions. So we learn that this vanishes if the first n minus 1 points are in u, but with no restriction on the nth point. Well, the next step is to remove the restriction on the next to last point. So you pick t as before, and now you make a shift of the last two points by u. And now we look at a correlator where the last two points are shifted by u. It vanishes for small real u because of the previous conditions. And it can be written like this, so h of u is holomorphic in the upper half plane again. So it's identically zero. And we repeat the process by shifting xn minus 1 and xn in some other time-like direction. So now we learn that the correlator vanishes if the first n minus 2 points are in u with no restriction on the last two. Well, then we keep going and we remove the restriction on the third to last point in the same way by considering what happens when we shift the last three points by a common time-like vector and so on. So we end up learning well, we end up learning that our car matrix element vanishes with no restriction on the x's at all, and this is the ray lier theorem. Uh, for this matrix element to vanish, no matter what the x's are, chi must be zero, and the states... Uh, well, once we remove the restriction on the x's, we've discovered that um, chi has to be zero, and therefore uh, just states produced by the restricted set of phi with x's in the small open set or dense in the Hilbert space. So that's the riesz leader theorem. But an arbitrary state can be created from the vacuum by acting with the product of local operators in a very small open set. Now I want to discuss briefly its interpretation. The first question is whether it contradicts causality. It certainly sounds unintuitive at first sight. Consider a state of the universe that on some initial time slice looks like the vacuum near U, but contains the planet Jupiter in some very distant space-like region, region V that's space-like separated from U. And let J be a Jupiter operator whose expectation value is 1 in a state that contains the planet Jupiter in the region V, while its expectation value is close to 0 otherwise. The riesz leader theorem says there is an operator X in region Sorry, this should have been region U. There's an operator X in region U such that the state X omega contains the planet Jupiter in region V. So in the vacuum, the expectation value of J is 0, but in the state X omega, the expectation value of J is close to 1. Is this a contradiction? Well, since X is supported in U and J in the space-like separated region V, J commutes with X and X dagger. So 1 is the, this matrix element, and then I can move x over, and it commutes with j, so I get here. So if x were unitary, there'd be a contradiction between saying that this matrix element is close to 0 and this one is close to 1. Because if x were unitary, x dagger x would be 1. But 
The reach leader theorem does not say we can pick x to be unitary. It just tells us that there's some x in region u that will create the planet Jupiter in a distant region v. All we found by comparing these formulas is that in the vacuum, the operators j and x to hagger x have a non-zero correlation function at space-like separation. But non-zero correlators at space-like separation happen in quantum field theory all the time. So there certainly is no contradiction. Rather, the intuitive interpretation of the reich leader theorem involves entanglement between the degrees of freedom in, inside an open set U and those at space-like separation from U. To explain the intuitive picture, though it's not strictly true, imagine that the Hilbert space has a factorization as a Hilbert space of inside degrees of freedom and those of outside degrees of freedom. Then any state in H, such as the vacuum state, would have a decomposition as a sum of tensor products of vectors here and vectors there. And in general, uh, in general, when we write a uh, state in terms of this form, the psi u and psi u prime might not be a basis of their Hilbert spaces because there aren't enough of them. But something like the riesz leader theorem will be true for any state omega such that the psi u and psi u prime do form bases of their respective spaces. Using the fact that the psi u prime are bases of h u prime, we could expand any state in this form with some vectors in h u and these basis vectors in h u prime. Then, because the psi u are a basis and the pi are non-zero, you can define a linear operator on h u by this. And that formula gives an operator x acting only on degrees of freedom in u, such that it maps the state we started with, omega, into any desired state of psi. So the intuitive meaning of the riesz leader theorem is that the vacuum state of a quantum field theory is analogous to this, where all states inside u are entangled with some states outside u. So in general, a state like this, where all the p's are positive, and the psi's and psi, psi u and psi u prime are bases, might be called a fully entangled state. By contrast, if the p's are all equal, we, we speak of maximal entanglement. So the riesz leader theorem intuitively means that the vacuum state of a quantum field theory is fully entangled in this sense between the inside and outside of an arbitrary open set U. But we cut some corners because our decomposition was not literally valid. If it were, then in the Hilbert space, there would be an unentangled pure state. And this would contradict the fact that in quantum field theory, the entanglement entropy is universally ultraviolet divergent. Universally means that every state has the same leading ultraviolet divergence in the entanglement entropy that the vacuum has because every state looks like the vacuum at short distances and the divergence comes from short distances. Now let's discuss an important corollary of the riesz leader theorem. So let U and V be space-like separated open sets in Minkowski space-time. And let B be an operator supported in V. Suppose that B annihilates the vacuum. Well, if A, if A is supported in U, then A and B commute. So B will have to annihilate A times the vacuum, because since A and B commute, B on A times the vacuum is the same as this, and it's zero because B annihilates the vacuum. But states of the form A times the vacuum are dense in the Hilbert space. So B annihilates a dense set of states, so it identically vanishes. So there's no state, sorry, there's no operator that's supported in a small region that can annihilate the vacuum state. The roles of U and V are symmetrical, so also a non-zero operator supported in U can't annihilate the vacuum state. So now we're ready for the second part of the talk, hoping there's still some time for it. So I let A sub U be the algebra of operators in region U. We've proved two facts about it. One is that states obtained by acting on the vacuum with an element of A sub U are dense in the Hilbert space. 
The jargon is that omega is a cyclic vector for this algebra. Second, any non-zero element of the algebra doesn't annihilate the vacuum, which is described by saying that omega is a separating vector. So in short, the Riesz-Leder theorem and its corollary says that the vacuum is a cyclic separating vector for A sub u. Now, consider a quantum system with the Hilbert space where I'll assume a factorization. And let A be the algebra of operators on H1. A little thought shows that first a general, okay, a general vector with such an expansion is cyclic for A if these, if these are a basis of their Hilbert space. It's separating if these are a basis for their space. So in the case of a tensor product, the cyclic separating vector means that in this expansion, the vectors in each side are bases of the respective Hilbert spaces. Well, now moving to the second part of the talk, what happens in quantum field theory? A mathematical machinery that's useful for analyzing entanglement when the Hilbert space does not factorize is called Tamita Takasaki theory, which was mentioned by Roberto in the last talk and also by some previous speakers. It applies whenever we have an algebra A that acts on a Hilbert space H with a cyclic separating vector. So what we've learned from the Riesz-Leder theorem and its corollary is that if omega is the vacuum of a quantum field theory, then the Riesz-Leder, th then Tamita Takasaki theory applies to the algebra of operators in any small open set. The starting point is that given an algebra A with a cyclic separating vector psi, you define an antilinear operator from H to itself by saying that SI on A psi is A dagger on psi. The definition make, makes sense because of the separating property. If you, if you could have A psi equals zero but A dagger psi not zero, you'd get a contradiction and the definition wouldn't make sense. But the separating property shows that, that, that A psi is only zero if A is zero. And it defines SI on a dense set of states because of the cyclic property, namely states A psi are dense in H. And then here are a couple obvious facts. Now, the modular operator is a linear self adjoint operator, S dagger S. It's positive definite because S is invertible. Okay, yeah. So S squared is 1, so S in particular is invertible. So it's a strictly positive definite operator. Now, to define relative entropy, we also need the relative modular operator. So here we let the state psi be cyclic separating and we let phi be any other state. And then the relative modular operator is an antilinear operator defined by that formula. Sorry. 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 We define that operator. It's not what's called the relative modular operator. The relative modular operator is this one, S dagger S again, but now with this modified S. So it's still self-adjoint and positive semi-definite, but it's not necessarily strictly positive. So now we can define relative entropy in quantum field theory. So we fix an open set U small enough that the vacuum is cyclic separating, which means there's another space-like separated open set. And we consider the algebra of operators in U. So let psi be a cyclic separating vector and phi any other vector. Then the relative entropy between psi and phi is defined as the matrix element in the state psi of minus the logarithm of the relative modular operator. That's the definition that was explained by Roberto in the last talk. It's not immediately obvious that this has anything to do with relative entropy as defined in terms of density matrices. But it's not hard to show that the definitions coincide whenever density matrices make sense. So we'd like to know, unfortunately, there isn't time to explain that. It's a very illuminating computation, but we'll have to skip it for today. So we'd like to understand positivity and also monotonicity of relative entropy from this definition. First of all, for positivity, if phi equals psi, then delta psi on psi is psi. 
So log delta psi annihilates psi. So if phi equals psi, the right-hand side is zero. And the relative entropy between psi and itself is zero. Does that mean I have five minutes? OK. So I don't have time to explain this last statement. Now consider a completely general state phi. Then we have this inequality for a positive real number lambda that implies an operator inequality. So that gives us a lower bound on the relative entropy obtained by replacing minus log delta with 1 minus delta. And well, if the states are orthonormal, well, the right-hand side is 0, to make a long story short, using the definitions. So that shows non-negativity of the relative entropy. And if you are more careful, you'll discover that it's positive as long as the two states can be distinguished by measurements in region U. Now, monotonicity arises if we consider a smaller open set U tilde in U. So now we have two different algebras, A U tilde inside A U, and therefore two different operators, relative operators, and associated modular operators. So the relative entropy between two states for measurements in U is the matrix element of minus log of one modular operator. And the relative entropy for the other one is, involves the logarithm of the other one. So we want to prove that relative entropy is monotonic under increasing the region considered in the sense that if u, if u tilde is a subregion of u, then this inequality should be obeyed. So this is important for applications. I mentioned one, and other speakers have mentioned others. The state psi and phi will be held fixed, so to lighten the notation, we'll omit subscripts and denote the operators as just SU, SU tilde, and likewise delta U, delta U tilde. The main point of the proof is to show that as an operator, delta U tilde is bounded below by delta U. As I'll explain in a moment, that implies that the logarithm of delta U tilde is at least as big as the logarithm of delta U. So the inequality we want is just the matrix element of this inequality in the state psi. So uh, to get from here to here, we do the following. If P and Q are positive self-adjoint operators and P is equal to or bigger than Q, I want to claim that log P is equal to or greater than log Q. To orient you, let me say that, for example, p squared might not be bigger than q squared. So this kind of statement is more subtle than it looks. We let r of t be tp plus 1 minus t times q. So r, because of this, r is an increasing function of t. And then we can write log r this way. And then we find that d by dt of log r we can write that way. And that's positive because it's B, A, B, with A and B positive. So the integral is positive, and thus d by dt of log r is non-negative. So r of 1 is equal to or bigger than r of 0, which gives that log p is equal to or bigger than log q. So monotonicity of relative entropy under increasing the size of a region will follow from an inequality that if the region U tilde is smaller than the region U, then delta U tilde is bigger than delta U. Okay. If we, okay. I might say that the rigorous proof is extremely short, and you can find it among other places in my notes. But instead, I'm going to try to make it intuitively obvious in the last two minutes, hoping I still do have two minutes. So if we try to understand this inequality and we're not used to unbounded operators in Hilbert's space, we might get confused. Because here are the definitions of the deltas. The two s's were defined naively by the same formula, where the sole difference is that a is in one algebra and a in one case and in a bigger algebra in the other case. So one algebra is bigger, so SU is defined on more states than SU tilde. But why does that lead to the inequality we want among the operators? Well, if we were too careless, we might assume that the operators are the same, because we might think two operators that agree on a dense subspace of Hilbert space actually coincide. 
But that's not true for unbounded operators. The proper statement here is that SU is an extension of SU tilde. It's defined whenever SU tilde is defined, and on states in which they're both defined, they coincide. And I'll just take one minute to try to give an intuitive idea. So in our problem, SU is a proper extension because there are states in AU that are not in AU tilde. So the fact that SU is a proper extension implies as a general Hilbert space statement the inequality that we want. The intuitive idea of the inequality is that the fact that SU tilde is defined on fewer states than SU is defined on corresponds to a constraint that's been placed on the states, and this constraint raises the energy. So if you think of the left and right-hand side as two Hamiltonians, a constraint on the way... Okay, you might imagine that S is like the exterior derivative, and then S dagger S is like the Laplacian on the manifold. And then you could take the Laplacian with Neumann boundary conditions or the Laplacian with Dirichlet boundary conditions. In one case, the wave function is forced to vanish on the boundary, reducing, meaning that, roughly speaking, it acts on fewer states, and therefore the energy is bigger. So the relation between these two operators is analogous to the Dirichlet and Neumann Laplacians. In about two more minutes, I would have explained that a little bit better, but given the time, perhaps I'll stop here for questions. I will say, though, that if you want to, <laughs> if you want to know much more about this, you can find it in my notes, and in particular, the rigorous proof basically fits on one slide. I just didn't present it because I thought you'd enjoy more reading it at home in peace and quiet. Well, thank you for this beautiful explanation. So, questions? Uh, yeah. Edward, th thank you for that explanation. When talking about relative entropy, you said that the abstract Araki's definition of relative entropy agrees with the yes. usual definition in terms of density matrices whenever density matrices make sense. Yes. So for quantum field theories, like, for instance, chiral fermions in two dimensions where density matrices don't really make sense, or boundary conditions for that matter, do you expect uh, relative entropy to have its usual properties? Well, first of all, I hate to give you the bad news, but Density matrices never strictly make sense in quantum field theory, even in non-chiral theories. But I mean, in a UV, even in a UV-regulated sense for a chiral uh, theory. Well, <laughs> I didn't have time to explain all the details in this proof, but this proof was general enough to apply for chiral theories. So the answer is going to be yes. There was some, there's one more question there, and then there. So you, so you explained the monotonicity of relative entropy implies strong subadditivity. And <clears throat> I was wondering whether by imposing extra constraints, you could derive stronger inequalities. For example, those that are known to hold in holographic states, but not generically in quantum, quantum states. Well, I'm not sure. The spirit of this is to derive universal statements. And if we had skipped the first part of the lecture on Vish Leader, then I would have had time to imitate this quantum field theory proof and explain the general proof of strong subadditivity in arbitrary quantum systems. So the proof that I didn't quite explain because I didn't have time to really explain this sentence can be imitated in a general quantum system. Well, in a sense, explaining that was the point of the notes, the archive document that I mentioned at the beginning. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, though. Uh, I don't know how to do that. You can use this kind of logic to prove additional facts, which are true for arbitrary quantum systems. But I don't know a good way to impose whatever further restriction there is in a holographic theory in the context of this reasoning. I feel, in some sense, one would want an analog of Tamita Takasaki theory for Poisson algebras rather than operator algebras on Hilbert space. In other words, I feel that what the question corresponds to is that 
large n means that there's a semi-classical version. Uh, I don't know what's the semi-classical version of Tomita Takasaki theory, though. Uh, does this proof apply to gauge theories? Yes, this this is a universal proof, so it, it applies to gauge theories. So, Edward, if I understand, all that went into the proof was that you had uh, cyclic separable states and uh, and, if, uh, and the appropriate uh, algebra then uh, defined for those states, is that? Uh... We were comparing two states, psi and phi, where one was cyclic separating. So for example, it could be the vacuum. Something I didn't have time to explain is that actually a dense set of states are cyclic separating. So psi did not have to be the vacuum. But then, given that, this the entire proof uh, yes. applies to Thank you. So are there any further questions? Yeah, um, here. Um, so, so, if, uh, so in this uh, um, definition and, uh, and the proof, where do you use the fact that uh, these AU and AU tilde are algebras? If I replace them by linear space of operators, what goes wrong? I'm not completely sure about the answer, so I don't want to try to answer the question. Um, there's there are a couple of papers you could look at. There's one by um, sorry, by Suvat Raju and I forget who, and they refer back to an earlier paper by um, Tiering, I think, I, or maybe Tiering and some, perhaps a co-author I'm forgetting. So uh, you can say something more generally, but I'd better not make a claim now. Any more questions? I don't see any. So thank you very much again.